what an episode we have in store for you today. Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and we have done 500 episodes of the show, but we have a first time guest today and oh, what a guest he is. Let me tell you a little bit about this gentleman's credentials. He is a seven time New York Times bestselling author. He is board certified family medicine physician specializing in nutrition medicine now for over four decades. He's also the president of the Nutritional Research Foundation. He is the incomparable Dr. Joel Furman. Welcome to the exam room. So glad to have you here. Thank you, Chuck. Pleasure to be here too. You and I started a fantastic conversation when we saw each other in Houston over the Thanksgiving holiday, well, close to Thanksgiving, and it was all around food addiction. And you are the first person, Dr. Furman, who I feel has never really struggled with super morbid obesity, but fully comprehends what it's like for their patients to actually be addicted to food. So as we reset here in this new year, my question to you is this, by and large, do you believe that people truly grasp how addictive a lot of the food that we eat every single day actually is? No, they obviously they don't grasp the fact that food, the food we eat can control our behavior and it can and we have different motivations in the brain. And that as you get acclimated to this food that is so calorically dense and creates such a strong caloric rush, it actually alters brain structure and function and makes you more dependent or on those foods, both physically and emotionally. So I think that food is a powerfully addictive substance and I don't even call it food. I call it food spelled backwards, which is doof. You gotta be a doof to put those non-food. You know, we're talking here about the addictive nature of numerous things we can talk about, but a lot of it is white flour and sugar and oil and fried foods. And of course, animal fatty animal foods, which also put a huge caloric rush in the bloodstream. What I'm saying is that if you're living in a natural world and you're eating foods that were adapted to natural species of animals, including humans, you couldn't get that many calories into the bloodstream at one time. We need processed foods in order to put so many calories in at one time. And it's completely unnatural for the brain. And it creates an effect on the opiate or dopamine centers of the brain, these centers of the brain that are involved with food addic with addiction, even of drugs. And I, it can be oversimplified with saying you build up um, dopamine insensitivity, you're insensitive to dopamine stimulation and you require more dependency on, on dopamine, but that's a vast oversimplification of all the intricate things that are going on simultaneously that creates food addiction. I'm curious, you mentioned oils in particular. In terms of your belief, in, are they all equally addictive? Is olive oil as addictive as coconut oil? Should we just avoid all of them? What's, what's your take, Dr. Furman? Well, um, yeah, let's, let's talk about that because obviously as you cook an oil and you heat it up in proportion to the heat that's used on the oil and the amount of time it's put under heat, you form more rancid compounds and the rancidity and the free radicals formed in the oil that's being cooked increases its risk of being genotoxic or carcinogenic, damage our genes or being harmful. But even let's say extra virgin olive oil is still fattening and fat on the body is detrimental to human health and longevity. And in proportion to the body fat percentage goes up, so increases in proportion your risk of life-threatening cancers. So there's no such thing as a, over, as a healthy overweight person. That's just a, mis, a myth that people want to believe in because they don't really, they're too, they have too much, they don't have enough knowledge um, and wisdom to know an emotional, um, robust emotional health in order to take, eat healthy enough to lose weight. And it's so difficult for people who are addicted to food to lose weight. So they give up and they, and if they're going to give up and they fail and they're giving bad information, then they have to take care of their cognitive dissidence, their discomfort by thinking it's okay to be overweight. And there's a lot of obvious no messaging out there telling people, just be comfortable with who you are. You can't lose weight anyway, and just be a healthy overweight person and don't worry and, and about all the stress involved in trying to diet and eat healthfully. And then there's a message out there. And 
I'm saying that um, it's it's not really accurate. It's not an accurate message. Certainly, we have compassion for an understanding of people who have who have difficulties eating healthfully. But if we want to help them and have the most amount of goodwill for them, they need a lot of information that they could have the capacity to make their their selves both healthier and happier. There's a lot of wisdom teaching here that they people need to have to be able to be able to comply with a healthy diet. But getting back to your um, original question about oil is that when we eat such a concentrated calorie that enters the bloodstream so rapidly, it tells your body to store fat because the body doesn't tolerate having a huge amount of calories in the blood. It has to get the calories out of the blood. So we can't put a huge amount of fat in the blood at one time and expect your body's going to break down fat cells. It's got even a few, it's going to store fat. So eating oil tells the body to store fat. And in and turning on fat storage mechanisms, it stops fat breakdown. And, and it, it's usually ex additional calories. In other words, um, we're not talking about putting oil on people who are starving and can't get enough calories to eat. We're talking about people putting an extra 500 calories of oil on top of their diet, which already has adequate calories. And that leads to them being overweight. And it could, for day, it could prevent weight loss for days, even if they calorically restrict, they're still not gonna lose weight because the oil turned on the fat storage mechanisms but oil also drives, is it because it enters the bloodstream so rapidly and because you created such a high caloric rush, that is brain as a brain stimulating substance. The high caloric entry in the blood stimulates the brain and makes you over time dependent or not feeling normal if unless you eat foods that have such a high caloric rush. You get acclimated to and dependent on the caloric rush. So now you need to eat after a meal. Like if I don't have something sweet or I don't have something that's more caloric, something like French fries or, or a piece of cheesecake or some ice cream, I'm not satisfied. I got to have something with the calories. I got, you know, just having a salad with an apple and a pear and some, you know, and a handful of beans or something isn't satisfying enough. I got to have something with more calories in it that's more going to sustain me. So the people get acclimated to when the brain gets acclimated to this caloric rush and it's a completely unnatural thing it never occurred in human history for the one for the 50,000 years we've been let's say I don't know it's 50,000 or 100,000 but in other words primates and 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 humans who are living on this planet for these thousands of years never had their hands on such foods that had such a high caloric concentration and connected to the bloodstream with such a amount of, high amount of calories and I always make this joke I say half of what we eat meets our needs and the other half meets the needs of our doctors. And even though it's a joke, and it's kind of like a little humorous, it's really scientifically accurate because Americans are eating approximately double the amount of calories people need for maximal, to maximize their health and lifespan. And the reason they can't sustain a low calorie, a, a lower calorie or a properly, the proper amount of food, the reason they can't sustain that is because their diet isn't nutritionally adequate enough and they're taking in foods with such a high caloric rush and they're, um, there's a lot of reasons why we can go into that, but and they're nutritionally deficient, which makes the body build up more metabolic waste products like reactive oxygen species and advanced glycation end products and lower levels of nitric oxide. There's a whole things that happen to the body that make you feel fatigued and uncomfortable unless you keep putting excess calories in the body. So you get dependent on excess calories. You don't feel well unless you consume excess calories. And so the conventional diet gets its fat from oils and animal fats predominantly. And the nutritarian diet that I recommend, the plant-based diet or that I recommend, gets its fats from nuts and seeds, not oils or animal fats. When you get your fat from nuts and seeds instead of animal fats and oils, the fat calories enter the bloodstream slowly over hours. And it never puts too much fat in the blood at one time because it takes three to four hours to digest an ounce of nuts or something, not, not three minutes. With oil, it goes from the lips to the hips in like three minutes flat. Whereas, you know, it goes right <laughs> the There's nothing stopping it like pouring right through the bloodstream, the wall of the digestive tract. When you eat nuts and seeds, because the calories are coming in so much more slowly, the body prep, you're not flooding the blood with so many calories. So the body preferentially burns that fat for energy as it comes in. It doesn't have to put, turn on fat storage hormones and store it. Um, and it's and because it's not going to rev up fat storage, it's not going to shut down fat breakdown. So it's completely different biological effects. I mean, my, I used to say on my PBS show, I used to make the joke, you know, I'd say um, to the audience, you know, sesame oil or sesame seeds. 
And they'd say sesame seeds. And I'd say, you know, walnut oil or walnut or walnuts or, you know, flax seeds or flaxseed oil, which is healthier, you know, which is different by completely opposite biological effects. And I'd hold up and I'd say motor oil, you know, and I'd, I'd just make a joke out of it. You know? <laughs> um, it does the, the, the fat content in the nuts and seeds that absorbs more slowly, well, far more right. slowly because of the fiber content. Would I be correct in assuming that? Yes, the type of fibers are sterols and stanols and fibers that bind fat. And in, in doing so, all the fat in the nut and seed is not absorbed into the bloodstream because some of the fat passes through into the toilet bowl because this, this, these um, fibers that hold fat are like fat magnets, so much so that they pull oxidized LDL, which is the bad actor causing heart attacks, out of the bloodstream. In other words, you have more oxidized LDL in the stool, lowering the bad, the worst type of LDL molecule. So nuts and seeds are associated with lower heart attack risks, um, lower cardiovascular death, and lower risk of irregular heartbeat, causing atrial fibrillation and sudden cardiac death. And more recent studies showing that the fat in nuts and seeds, especially from the high ALA-containing nuts and seeds, which are walnuts and flax seeds, chia seeds, and hemp seeds, high in ALA, normal omega-3 fatty acid, have a protective effect on stabilizing arrhythmias of the heart, including lowering risk of atrial fibrillation, um, all compared to a low a diet too excessively low in fat. So we're saying that nuts and seeds add cardiovascular protection, and the fats from them, even though they're relatively slowly absorbed and burned as energy, still have a beneficial effect on on the heart and other body and other um, body longevity mechanisms. They're almost anti-aging foods. I want to go back to what it was you were talking about a little bit earlier about how if a person who is used to eating the ultra high calorie diet, you say the majority of us are eating about twice as many calories as we uh, really need, but you don't really feel right until you get that high calorie, high fat uh, snack in you or meal. And it just, it, it, it took me right back to the day that I realized how strong of a hold food had on me at 420 pounds where i had been trying to diet for just three days not even 72 full hours and my body was just freaking out especially mentally and then as soon as i took that first bite of fast food again it was as if all of that anger and anxiety and even sickness just kind of washed away and i felt great but the thing that was so profound in that moment for me, Dr. Furman, was also the realization that like, oh my God, I'm hooked on fast food the way that a lot of people are hooked on drugs and alcohol. What do you think it's going to take for us as a society to realize that basically every time you are kind of going through the drive-thru, and I am admittedly biased on this, but every time you are going through the drive-thru, you are literally getting your fix. And then when we think about that, it kind of takes the whole idea that a cheat day is even a healthy thing and it throws that out the window. That's such a foreign concept for so many of us. How are we going to screw our heads on straight here, Doc? You are 100% correct in the way you're seeing this because, you know, you might remember that one of my best-selling million copy selling books was called Eat to Live, written 2004. And, um, I had people follow a very strict diet for six weeks, but then I gave them authorization or permission to be to cheat and to um, and to do it 90 percent rule to do this 90 percent correct and just stay 10, you know. But over the years and decades since then, so many people have failed or do fail because of the continual cheating or or going you know, having things that aren't healthy. And when you have that addictive, that history of that addictive relationship with food, you keep lighting the fire under your desires and it prevents you from resolving your, your need for those particular addictive substances. And so over the years, I've gotten more strict, not less strict. I, like you, I'm saying to people, you know, my experience of the last 30 years is that the people who've lost 50 pounds, lost 100 pounds, lost 150 pounds and kept it off the rest of their life. If you look at the success and what were the factors that led to their success. These were people who, when they jumped in, didn't keep cheating and going back and forth. They stayed on the program strictly and they felt so good and they got, and the results they received were so incredibly positive that they stayed with it long term and they don't like the way they feel and they like the way they think and they like the way they, they like the new person they've become enough to continue with this program. That doesn't mean they didn't have a difficult time the first six months. 
that doesn't mean they didn't feel worse when they first started out and went gone through withdrawal from and detoxification from and feeling miserable both physically and emotionally the first month that they've done that. I've seen, you know, as you are aware, I have a retreat in San Diego where people come and stay here for one, two, or three months to get to lose weight and get well from food addiction. And they could be irritable the first few weeks. They could be upset and they're giving up these this love affair they had with these substances and they have to give them up and they're not getting them. And they're, you could see how it ignites the brain and it's very stressful for them making this decision to give up something that they're so, that's so, they're so intimate within their life and they think there's their life and their happiness is so dependent on. And once they're, but the longer they're away from this substance, that's why, you know, that's why people go away to these retreats or health places for a week or two or three even, and the chance of recidivism is so high. Because like with cocaine and rehab, it takes months to get rid of, to, and that you have to be away from these substances for a longer period of time for the brain to get well and to no longer to be so overly attracted to these things. And I'm saying exactly what you're saying, that the people that still kind of cheat, it's like the alcoholic thinking they can go to the bar on the weekend and have alcohol, it makes it more difficult for them, not easier for them. The more they think, keep their foot in that other world and they don't want to fully give it up, the more it keeps the light written, on the, the fire burning on their desire for those substances instead of letting it dim out and just and the ashes just go away. And their taste but muscle improves and they lose the desire from foods if they can stay away from them long enough. But they also, we, you know, we're also talking about here that they have to learn a lot about a different way of seeing the world. For sure. They have to change their psychology to be to sustain for sustained wellness. It's not all about food here. It's about the food. It's about the biology and the science. And it's also about having robust emotional health and what it takes to change your outlook on the world to be able to free yourself of addiction, especially food addiction, because food addiction is, is the more difficult addiction to conquer, more so even harder than alcohol addiction and drug addiction. The re there's a lot of reasons for that, but the main reason is, is you get negative peer pressure and you can receive a lot of criticism, um, ridicule, and peer from your community for live, trying to live healthfully because everybody else is an addict trying to convince you to join them in their addictive, unhealthy behaviors. Whereas with alcohol or cigarettes, people are supporting you and applauding you for coming off your alcohol or your cigarettes or your drugs. But with food addiction, they're criticizing you for coming off, the, for no longer eating healthy and imbibing in unhealthy and un, self-destructive substances with, with them. You know, So it makes it much more difficult. And that's why you need such much ro robust emotional health for, to do this. Oh, for sure. And I know like once you've, you know, you've gone through that detox and you're out in the world, even after, you know, being at your retreat for six months, it could be a lion's den once you step out that door. Because I think by and large in the world, there are, you know, two kinds of people. You've got the kind of people who really don't have a clue what you and I are talking about and just think that they're being nice by offering these foods. And a lot of times they can be really pushy or maybe they just think that you're weird and they don't understand, but they, you know, they want you to have this. And then you have the other kind who completely understand where you're at, see that you've lost weight. But the fact that you're saying no is forcing them forcing them to have a conversation with themselves that they're not ready to have yet. That is, again, the definition of addiction. They're not ready to make those changes yet. So just as you said, they try to drag you back into that addictive den with them. And it's so difficult. And so I like the fact that when people go to your retreat, they are there for that extended period of time so that they can build up that confidence within themselves to borrow a line from Nancy Reagan to just say no the next time they're out at dinner or at a social event or something like that so that they're comfortable making those healthy choices no matter how much they get ribbed or ostracized or anything like that. You have to have that strong resolve. Do you get the opportunity to really work with the patients on building up that confidence and giving them some techniques on how to deal with those types of situations? A hundred percent. We are right on the same page here. Because if you just teach them about nutrition, and, the, and of course, we're saying to people, you don't have to have heart attacks. You don't have to have strokes. Science has advanced, so we know what causes dementia. We can protect against that. We can, you, don't, you, you can live longer life without cancer and you are in control of your health destiny if you and why live in why put self destructive foods in your body why would a normal person acting in their own behalf do anything that's destructive to their own survival and their own happiness but all that information 
And all the science about that is not sufficient. So what we're talking about now, you and I, are the techniques we use, and we have to do a lot of this work with these people in order for them to sustain the benefits um, having to do with changing their pattern of going for externally generated self-esteem into internally generated self-esteem. If I can just, that'll take a few minutes for me to describe what that means. By all it means. means. It means we're socialized in the United States to go after externally generated self-esteem. We want people to like us. We want to look important. We want to look superior. We want to have the most money, the best jobs, the best athletes, the best dress, the best, look the best, impress other people and have people like us. We want to post our pictures on Instagram, get all the likes and people tell you how much they, and, and you want to impress other people. And that stuff is, that's just like, it's like eating junk food. It's a never ending, unsatisfying, never, never sufficiently going after power, superiority, and feeling you're better than other people. It's, it doesn't lead to long-term happiness. It's almost like the drug way or the junk food way to happiness to try to get other people to like you and to feel you're important or impressive. And it's very dangerous and attract, attracting for people. And in, versus that now, when they have that attitude of having other people to like them, and we've also um, tracked this with people who failed on this program. In other words, we used to work with um, large numbers of people adopting this program from Whole Foods Market and tracking the people that failed versus the people that were able to follow it long term and see the differences. And the ma major differences was their um, susceptibility to peer pressure. Um, but in any case, which we're talking about now, internally generated self-esteem is different. It makes you feel compassionate and at one and equal to other people. Every human being is important. And we're not looking to feel more important than another person. We build our own self um, confidence because we know that our motive is to have compassion for and try to assist, have goodwill for and care for other people and our ability to have emotions for things outside of the self, to appreciate the world, to appreciate the structure of nature or art, to be able to do things that are productive to help humanity, to, care, to have an opportunity to, to help another person. All these things build our self-esteem. So when somebody says to you, well, well, if I had to eat that way, I'd rather be dead. You know, who would want to just live on carrot sticks and celery and where do you, you know, then you're not looking for a comeback. You're not trying to feel like you're more important, no better than them. You're not trying to, you know, impress them and not, you know, you're just thinking, okay, this is an opportunity, a mindful opportunity for me to have goodwill for them. And the intent to have goodwill or the intent to do something that could benefit them to just show them I care about them or you feel for them or you understand them might give you the opportunity, maybe, to have an effect on, a positive effect on them in their life. Maybe not, but it doesn't really matter whether you had the positive effect, it has to do with your purpose, whether your internal purpose was to have a good effect, to show them some care and some intent to, to try to be useful to them. So maybe I'm not gonna try to, so that, and it may happen three years from now that, that my relationship that I built with this person could have a good effect on them and it may not be the right time to, Put, you know, to do anything to try to influence them in that way. But, I'd say, but that's this communication that they started with me, even if it's criticism of me, is an opportunity for me to pursue this relationship, show them I care about them as a human being, and I can have, and I maybe can have an opportunity to have a, be a good effect on their life in some way. And that gives you more lasting and more lasting fulfillment and makes you give you a much more peaceful light life. And so we're talking about the type of wisdom where people, because when you come off your addictions, then your body is going through frustration and irritation and the food causes more anger and more and people look for things to dislike they develop a negativity bias and they hate everything or looking for things to be irritated by or to complain about and now we have to try to give people a positivity bias where they're looking to things to like out of themselves don't forget the cocaine addict the heroin addict the really intense food addict their primary primitive brain has taken over their behavior and they just want what they want and they can't live without it. And the rest of the world has dimmed or dulled. They don't care about their role to benefit humanity, the good they can do to benefit other people, their love and emo and care for the outside world, their appreciation of the beauty and the magic of a piece of bok choy or the beauty of the sunset. Or they're not, they're more, in, it makes you more narcissistically consumed with your own needs the more you're an addict because you've got to meet those needs for those addictive substances because stimulating the brain is an overriding. Um, amount of 
um, importance in your life. And so these brain stimulating substances, it's not the person's fault that they took over the brain. These brain stimulating substances like cocaine, alcohol, sugar, and oil, and these high takes over the brain and, and it affects their behavior and it makes a person behave more narcissistically. And the more addicted they are, the more self-consuming. And they make most people are dysthymic because they create it, it affects the brain negatively. It makes you less neuro, lose your neuroplasticity, which then makes you more prone to this depression and dysthymia. I know I'm talking fast and giving a lot of information. I probably should slow down and break it down slower, but you know, we have limited time. But in any case, now this person who's the addict isn't that happy about life. They're, the word dysthymia means they're not totally depressed, but they're not excited and passionate about getting up out of bed and what they can get done every day and how they can do something that they love to do, that it's important for the good for the world and good for them. And they enjoying what their work they're doing with passion and excitement. It means they just work to make money so they can go and go to the, you know, the bar and drink alcohol or go to the fast food restaurant and eat some french fries or a piece of pizza or, a, or some ice cream. They're, they're, they're living for their stimulating, self-destructive addictions. They live for their addictions and, the, and their life is not very happy. In order to succeed in, the, in this arena of not just weight loss but superior health, the anti-aging longevity, this, this diet style that I call a nutritarian diet, which just means super healthy, to, be in, to stop eating self-destructive foods. You know, you stop eating, doesn't matter whether you could be on a vegan diet and still eat self-destructive foods, right? You're, it's, so you're we're talking here about eating a diet where you're focused on doing what's best for your, body, your own body and your own, in your own lifespan and your own happiness. And that has to be enmeshed with, a, with your own emotional habits and psych an improvement in your psychology and your emotional health that so in order to sustain taking good care of your health and this is what we're trying to over time build people the ability to like to care for the outside world to appreciate the aesthetic structure of the world the world and the universe and nature to care for other people more and to try to have to pause before you speak to think about what your intent is so you can make, and you're not offended by other people anymore about if they, your, your ego is out of it now because there's no value to trying to feel you're superior, important, or that you are, have this high impression of yourself. Those things don't matter. Those things don't give you happiness. Throw your ego out, flush it down the toilet. Who cares? You know, now we got to think about having power and having, you know, more money even. All these things are not important. What's going to give you lasting happiness is your ability to have positive, good emotions enjoy your life every day, get a lot of pleasure from the world around you and have good intentions to have a positive effect on people you come in contact with and which could then lead to even more powerful effects to have more powerful effects on humanity like, like you. Like you you're, um, took what you've learned and you took the benefit that you've done for yourself and you've magnified it like a lighthouse and able to be able to have good effects on many people around the world, which is a beautiful thing. And that's what we see with people that su have succeeded in losing weight and keeping it off and succeeded in staying leading healthy for the rest of their life, is if we analyze those people and what was related to their success, we see that they didn't keep dabbling back and forth and have a foot in both worlds. And they've developed personal, they've built self-esteem from their using their own experiences and, the own, and their own success to be a role model to benefit others. So instead of using it for superiority or contempt, they've used it as a means to build more a good power. I say superpowers. You've built the superpowers up because we don't need the superpowers to bend steel with our bare hands or to fly through the air. We're not being invaded by aliens. We're being invaded by heart disease and strokes and people, you know, by, by depression and mental illness and, by, by, and anger and violence and, and conspiracy thinkers. We're being invaded by people who are, who are brains that are not and bodies that are not functioning well because they're poisoning themselves with bad, with bad health. So the people that succeed, they become a role model to have a more positive effect on humanity and their peers. And that sustains them and makes them more emotionally healthy as well as making them more physically healthy. And it gives them the power to help other people, but also to stay with their own, to not feel that they're, they're pulled or our need to eat unhealthy or experiment or recreate with dangerous food. So it's complicated, but these things take a long time to learn. Even though we're going over this in, a, in an hour or so, 
these things take a long time to learn and practice and ingrain in your life. So when people leave here after a month or so, when they leave here after getting this training, they've practiced it enough. And then, then and the longer you're practicing this and doing it, then you could sustain the program and stay with it long term. Because as you're probably aware, most people that even learn that they about learn about healthy eating or even hear our message, they don't stick with it or they can't stick with it because they don't really, they don't have enough knowledge and enough training to anticipate all the difficulties that could push them in the wrong direction. 100%. And you know, it's, it, you're kind of telling my life story without telling my life story. I mean, I, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm just thinking it's like, I was chasing fame and fortune before I lost weight, trying to be this bigger than life personality on morning radio, wanted to be big Chuck on big 100.3 in the Washington DC mm -hmm. area. And mm -hmm. once I checked that and I got healthier, I've achieved my greatest success. And it wasn't because I'm still chasing fame or fortune. What drives me now is exactly what you said. It's like, take what I've learned and magnified it and help people. And my greatest reward, what drives me more than anything, aside from, you know, maintaining my personal health, is to get these emails and messages from other people who were where I once was, and to say, thank you so much. I've learned so much. And because of this, I now have my health. I have my life back for the first time in decades. And Dr. Furman, if I'm lying, I'm dying. That means more to me than any paycheck ever possibly could because I know that feeling and it is the sweetest thing in the world because that person then can magnify their story and affect others who will then affect others in a positive light. And I think that, you know, just kind of optimistically thinking here, I think that's how things are eventually going to change. It's just going to be that ripple effect, but change takes time. Change absolutely takes time. Right, and you're exactly you're exactly true what you're saying in that um, the people that succeed they they have some personal input and some personal satisfaction, and now they can want to be the best version of themselves. Now they want to maintain their own health, their own longevity, and their own wellness because they know they're now more effective at impacting other people and having a more positive effect. They're more powerful in their ability to have goodwill for others. It increases their, the good power, not the bad power, right? So we have to, you know, so, and so they have more, of, and that is the best form of healthy, emotional, we say internally generated self-esteem, not externally generated, you know? So that's the, it's switching that over and learning that. And you've learned, that's amazing. And I'm so proud of you because <laughs> you've come to, you've learned this on your own accord Instead of, you know, and certainly it doesn't matter how you learn it, you know, where you get it from, but we all, you know, it's really important. And when people learn this, it really, it changes their outlook on life and they have more hope for their own selves. And that's not the sorry me and the everybody against me and the people, you know, if you had the stress in my life, you would be this way too. They start <laughs> to be able to handle the stress in their life because because being an addict and being unhealthy doesn't help you handle the stress. It, it, you're more able to, to you know, you're much more relaxed and you're not affected by people. You're, you're not affected by the negativity in other people because, you know, you have more compassion and you have more, you know, so yes, it all is intertwined. And here we are talking about this. Here we are, you and I are talking about um, eating healthy, losing weight and living longer. And we're relating it back to um, having robust emotional health and developing wisdom, you know, to be able to sustain good health, right? It all, it all works together. One hand definitely washes the other. There's no question about it. There's no question about it. But I also feel like with this audience, I mean, we are nutrition nerds uh, and, and we love to, to sprinkle in some more science. So we've talked a lot about fat. Now let's talk about another thing that I know for a fact that I was hooked on heavily, and that is salt. Um, you mentioned that as well. And when I added up what my typical order was, at the uh, drive through I mean, I was getting well over 10,000 milligrams of sodium every That's single good. day. I mean, it was just ridiculous amounts of, of salt. How addictive is salt when compared to the fat and the sugar, which I always refer to as the holy trinity of food addiction? Absolutely. You and I are so much on the same page. You're my um, guy. Absolutely. Salt is um, almost as addicting as the caloric rush, 
The caloric rush is number one. That means how many, and that's oil and sugar and white flour. And don't forget, white flour is a sugar equivalent. It comes into the bloodstream with glucose at the same speed as eating sugar, straight sugar or honey does. You know, so honey, maple syrup, sugar, white flour, it's all just sugar. It's the cake diet people eat, right? <laughs> but then worldwide, sodium is probably the leading cause of death worldwide, of accelerating death, premature death. I mean, the whole world that eats sodium develops high blood pressure and heart disease. It doesn't even matter if you're on a vegan diet because if you're salting your food, you're still at risk of hemorrhagic stroke because salt insidiously weakens the endothelial lining of blood vessels. It causes irritation, inflammation, reduction of nitric oxide production. We call it microvascular hemorrhages that little over the years build up weakening the interior lining of the blood vessels. What I'm saying right now, and is immunosuppressive too, and also is weakens the, the gut lining as well. So it's not just that salt raises blood pressure, because you know how people say, oh, I can have salt, my blood pressure is great. Well, they don't realize that everybody's blood pressure is great to a point in their life when after eating salt for enough years, they develop high blood pressure like everybody else does. And then taking it away, it doesn't have as much effect anymore because you took it away after you had the, your, neural, your sympathetic tone in your brain flipped over, and now you take it away, it's not gonna be as responsive. But in any case, then we don't know. My biggest gripe with the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology is that they advise people with heart disease and with high blood pressure to cut the salt down from the average American of over 3,000 a day to under 1,500 milligrams a day. And I'm saying that's like telling a person to quit smoking after they develop lung cancer. That's like saying, oh, people come and develop lung cancer or, or, or COPD or you know, lung disease from smoking should cut, should cut back on or cut out smoking. Well, that's ridiculous. We should, if it was bad, if, they should, if it caused that problem, they shouldn't cut it out after they developed the problem. They should have never had it to begin with. It shouldn't be educating people to cut out with heart disease or high blood pressure to cut out sodium. It should be educating children in the schools and it should, a whole population from birth to death should cut out sodium, should cut out the added sodium if we want to prevent these heart disease and, and strokes. And vegans are, of course, still risk for hemorrhagic strokes from eating salt in their diet, maybe even higher risk than people who eat animal products who get embolic strokes. But in any case, just to reinforce this, there are primitive societies that live, that don't live with, um, involved in civilizations that use salt, like tribes in the Amazon jungle that don't salt their food. And those populations, the children and the infants, the toddlers have very low blood pressure. They stay stable through childhood and late teenage years, it doesn't rise. And the most middle-aged and elderly people have the same blood pressure as children and toddlers do in these populations that don't salt their food. Um, whereas in America, for example, chill, toddlers and children, by the time they're teenagers, they already have blood pressure that's borderline, that's high, elevated, it's no longer normal. It's not considered high by our American standards, but our American standards are, are not really, are not normal. You know, 140 over 90 above is high blood pressure, but actually, you know, probably anything above 120 is probably really high blood pressure you know, we probably should be running in the 100 to 110 range. But in any case, what I'm saying is blood pressure rises gradually and our, it's our lifetime exposure to sodium, just like our lifetime exposure to cigarettes that affects these later life risks. And you don't wait till you develop disease to cut down or cut it out. You do it now as early as possible in life if you wanna have the maximum lifespan possible and not be at risk of later life issues. So, so absolutely, salt is highly addicting it deadens the taste buds and makes you no longer be able to enjoy natural foods. By the way, too much sugar past the bliss point, too much salt, and too highly spiced foods all have an effect to neg a negative effect on weakening the taste muscle. So now a piece of lettuce or a strawberry or a slice of avocado doesn't taste as delectable or artichokes are so good without anything on them. Just plain artichoke hearts are so flavorful. But people who are eating standard foods with so much salt and sugar and spice, they even the hot spices, they can't even enjoy the, an artichoke or a piece of asparagus just naturally without doused in something because they don't even, doesn't even taste flavorful to them. Mm. 
you know what blows my mind kind of to, to that effect of like shifting taste buds i call that kind of the blunting effect and that that happens I believe in the brain as well. I've seen brain scans of a long-term cocaine user and uh, someone who has, uh, you know, been overweight for many, many, many years. And the cocaine user, they they do the brain scan as the person's using cocaine. They trace the the dopamine response there. And then you also uh, look at, you know, the overweight person eating a donut, you know, which has a lot of fat and a lot of sugar in there. And I'm telling you, the 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 way that the brain reacts is absolutely identical. But what, you know, I also understand is had these been people using cocaine for the first time or eating a donut for the first time, you would have seen a much larger response in the brain getting that ultra rush. So there is that blunting effect where over time you need more and more and more and more and more of these foods. And again, it takes me right back to my own story. I didn't start out eating 10,000 calories of junk food a day. I started out eating much less than that, but my appetite grew and my, my cravings grew more and more and more over time. So I needed more over time. With the people who you work with, do you hear a lot of those similar stories? Like doc, I started off getting just the single cheeseburger and fries, but before I knew it, I was ordering two and three combo meals at a time just to get that same rush, that same high. Yeah, ab absolutely. What you're saying is typical, and and that's why we have so many people. The whole population is overweight. You know, we're we're misinformed because we think only seventy percent of the population is overweight, but that's because the U.S. government uses a B, uh, twenty-five as the demarcation BMI between normal weight and overweight. All long-lived people and long-lived societies have BMIs below twenty-three, and the longest the longest lifespan BMI for a woman is between eighteen and twenty-one, and for a male is between nineteen and twenty-two. So if we use a BMI as 23 as the demarcation line, then 89% of Americans are overweight. So everybody is overweight practically. And those who are not overweight are usually unhealthy and smokers or alcoholics or people, there's other medical or, or health reasons why they're, not, why they're not overweight because if they were healthy, they'd be overweight eating American food. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, 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 the diet, is, it's only 2.4% of Americans that are a normal weight because they eat healthfully and exercise regularly. It's only 2.4%, by the way. Wow. But, but yes, yeah, so we're getting to this idea that we're living in a nation of people who are addicts and then and that's what makes it so difficult for people to change because almost everybody else is an addict and they don't they're not comfortable with you moving to a different to take becoming a health nut or whatever you know there you make them feel uncomfortable but in any case um it's absolutely true what you're saying here about the lead that the more you eat unhealthily the more you get dependent and want to have and you go in that direction want more just like drugs a and that um when you when you cut that out from the person, their chemically their brain is chemically going to suffer, enhancing their amount of anxiety and agitation and irritation and discomfort when you take those foods away, and also phys feeling physically sy symptomatic. And the main physical symptom people get is fatigue. So they're eating excess calories, and they you bring them down to a normal level of calories but they don't feel they have enough energy with a normal amount of calories. They're fatigued with a normal amount of calories. They only can feel they get enough energy production if they overeat calories, otherwise they feel wasted and wiped out. So they think, and they think they start to equate the feeling of fatigue with the need for calories, and they think fatigue is a symptom of hunger instead of recognizing that it's a withdrawal symptom from overeating and eating improperly. And that, and so people think they, even people believe, they think they gotta eat before they go to the gym. They think they gotta eat to keep their energy up. They gotta eat before they're gonna exercise. They're gonna keep their, they're gonna drink Gatorade or whatever, whatever it is they're doing. Um, they, they believe that fatigue is a, is a hunger and it biologically, and while overweight people don't understand that they have enough calories in their body to live for months, they're not eating to get energy, they eat, you know. So we have to dis divorce them from that idea and they have to be able to tolerate increased fatigue for a few weeks while they're going through the detox process and getting acclimated to a lower caloric load. Because unless you instruct a person, unless they're aware that they're going to feel worse for a few weeks and they're gonna feel more fatigue as their body circulates more biological um, compounds, waste products in the bloodstream for removal, and you stop, the you stop the detoxification or repair by putting more food in again. So every time they eat, they feel better because they stop withdrawal or stop detoxification. What I'm saying right now is that withdrawal from a negative practice which causes symptoms makes is a is moving in the right direction towards better health. 
So feeling bad means you're getting better. And taking something to make you feel good is getting worse. And this way of behaving has infiltrated American and the modern world so that people think feeling good is getting healthy. You have a headache? Take a drug to get it to make it go away. Have a fever? Take a drug to lower it. Feel fatigued? Eat more food. You know, feel, go to a doctor with a rash? Get a steroids and suppress the poisons back inside you. It's all about symptomatic treatment to push the poisons back in, where anything right directed the body does to push the poisons out, we're too uncomfortable with that. We don't let it finish its job, so we never have a headache. So if we have a headaches, we should get to the cause of the headaches. We never have them anymore in our life. But instead, by not getting to the cause and by taking drugs to suppress headache, it can turn an occasional headache into a chronic headache syndrome. So now the person has to be on drugs the rest of their life. So generally speaking, mostly what doctors do is use toxic substances, pharmaceutical substances that are toxic, to change the expression of disease and to suppress detoxification symptoms so people can feel better or to, you know, lower blood pressure, lower blood glucose, lower cholesterol, so people can continue to live in an unhealthy manner. So allowing their diseases to advance because now they look things that look okay, they feel better, the numbers look better, they think they're better, but they're just still getting worse because they still didn't haven't changed the cause and their blood vessel disease, the aging of the body, the development of methylation defects that accumulative lead to cancer continue to go at the same rate to their eventual tragedies that occur, which means that medical care has very little effect, if any, on extending human lifespan or preventing. And we know that with all the advent of modern cardiology and drugs and blood pressure lowering and diabetic medications and all, all this stuff, we're not seeing fewer people living, not having heart attacks or more people living longer, we're living shorter than ever before, and we're still not having no impact on, you know, the medical care almost has no impact on longevity, suffering, or human tragedy. So we have the, we have the, um, this advancements in nutritional science. We have an unprecedented opportunity in front of us to really live healthier and happier than ever before. But such as, but hardly anybody's taking advantage of this. But that's why it's so exciting for, you know, seeing the work you're doing and and what you guys are doing and, and how when the and the um how 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 much overlap that we have that we're both working in the same field and both contributing in such a great way and and, the, and your outreach to help so many people is so exciting to me well thank you and uh yeah i i definitely feel um a lot of synergy here uh between the two of us so let's end on like them what i want to do is like paint um just a really accurate but hopefully really positive picture too new year new you the changes that we've talked about especially in the beginning they're not going to be easy because you're talking about beating an addictive beast that has been controlling you for so long but you have worked with thousands and thousands and thousands of people and I'm just curious, in all of that time, your 40 plus years in practice, has there ever been an individual who has not, at the very least, had the potential to overcome the addiction that's been holding them back for so long? Yes, you're, you're right, is that, that in all my years of practice, I've seen many people succeed and many people fail, you know. I've had people call me up from the emergent, from the ICU after a heart attack and say, I know I should have listened to you. You told me I was going to have a heart attack, but I couldn't do it. But now I'm going to do it. You know, so I've, I've seen these happen uh, for years and years. And, and, you know, what we're saying here is that, that the potential is within all of you, that people, that a lot of people are strongly resistant, but if they're exposed to the right type of information, in a way that's with, given with compassion and kindness, and it takes time to learn this information, but with the right type of exposure and right type of information, people can succeed and get more happiness and pleasure out of their life and be most physically and emotionally happier. And they don't feel they've given up their joy of living or their, you know, because other people live for their food recreation. Food becomes their whole life. And now they've opened their life up to more pleasures. It's not just all about food. They feel better about themselves. They still enjoy food, but they have more opportunity to have pleasure in their life. So, yes, thank you for that um, for that um, important point that we're not like monks giving up our pleasure of living. We're actually enhanced our pleasure of living, enhanced our happiness, enhanced the joy in our life, and still being able to eat delicious food at the same time, except our taste buds have improved so we can get more joy out of eating healthy food. We don't need the unhealthy food to get joy out of eating food. 
and we're satisfied with fewer calories and we don't need to eat extra ex additional calories to feel okay. So yes, we're not giving up being happy or healthy and you're not happier because you're imbibing in these recreating with, with um, dangerous food. So no good point and it's, it gives more joy and peace and to the world to people take to take better care of their health. It doesn't take the joy away from them. Oh, life is just too sweet now to go back. I would be miserable if I went back to eating uh, the the old way, man. So here's here's some resources, uh, everybody, right now. I, I encourage you to check out. Number one, uh, get Dr. Furman's latest book, Eat for Life. There's a link to that in the show description and in the episode notes. Also, uh, he's a fellow podcaster. Go ahead, give a follow and subscribe there on Apple and Spotify, wherever it is that you get your shows. Eat to Live podcast, great resource for you there. Of course, drfurman.com, where you can take the five-day Nutritarian challenge, and it will change the way that you think about food forever. I know that we planted some seeds here today, but man, you really want to dive into it. Take this five day challenge. And then, if you really want to dive in, this would have helped me tremendously when I was at rock bottom that night that I realized that I was a full blown food junkie. If Dr. Furman, I would have known about your Eat to Live retreat out in San Diego, I may have made a different choice, but I know that it has changed the lives for thousands of people who have come through your doors. And so there's a link for you to learn about that in the show description and in the episode notes as well. I encourage you all to check that out as you embark on the healthier you in this new year. Dr. Joel Furman, I can't wait to have you back on. We're going to talk some more about some science. I know that we can get into autoimmune disorders, the treatment protocols for uh, disease reversal on that, asthma, headaches, cancer, you name it. Uh, we can do a lot of good in this world, and I just can't wait to continue the conversation with you, my friend. Thank you, Chuck. So good to, I'm so happy um, to have, um, to know you and to, and to see, and to have a relationship with you and so proud of what you've accomplished and what you're doing. So excited to have you as a friend. Thank you, my friend. The feeling is absolutely more than mutual. You take care. Thank you.